Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for a series of A4000 and A1200 repairs. So uh, I'll talk about these uh, the different boards, obviously, as I go through the series here. I'm not going to show you them all at this point in time. I thought I'd focus on the two A4000s to start with. I've got my A4000 below this. Uh, you might just be able to see at the edge of the case there. So yeah, I'm on with 4000s at the moment. Uh, I'll show you what this one's doing. The first thing, obviously, is the battery needs to come off there. I'll give you a bit of an inspection around the board. They're in not too bad condition, these boards, actually. They're probably two of the better boards I've looked at compared to the other three or four A4000s that have been on my channel. These are much uh, tidier in general. So there were a few issues with this one. Obviously, the battery needs removing. It's going to need a recap. But besides those things, there's very little damage. Uh, now, there are two issues, as I say. We'll show you the first one. If I just switch this on. So it's not booting with kickstart at all. Just sat on a black screen. Straight away, I don't think you can see there, it's like the video is faded. We've got very low brightness. And can you see it's frozen on a green screen? So predominantly, this will stay on a green screen and the other board behaves the same way. So they've got a similar, if not identical fault in this respect, but not in terms of the, the brightness. The brightness is unique to this board. And uh, if I just keep power cycling it, sometimes I'll get a red screen shortly after the green screen. And this is with the, I say Diagram, not Kickstart. But Kickstart just sits there on a black screen. So that's the first issue. And then the second one is when you get beyond well, in fact, there's two issues there already, really. One, it's not booting diagram. Two, there's a brightness problem. And uh, you'll see there's a third issue. When we do get into diagram, it will start to display in the wrong colours. And it, we get some corruption to the bottom of the screen. Now, at that point, it passes the IRQ tests, passes the CIA tests, passes the chip RAM test. So those are seemingly good. Uh, I can't really test much else. I, I'm not testing the sound, but I'm not too interested in that at this stage because it will need a recap anyway. Look, there's a red screen. But the main issue is why is it failing to boot? Why does it sometimes boot but then give you corruptions and things at the bottom half of the screen? I think the first thing I'm going to focus on is this brightness issue because it's easier, I think, to look at that. We can make some educated guesses there and go well it's going to be video DAC related so I've got the schematics here we'll have a look at the schematics in a minute red screen again look and uh, I'll see what I can think of checking around the uh, video circuit there but I'm suspecting something to do with the DAC maybe it's got a low VREF or something like that Finally, it went in. Now you can see straight away, look at the video. <laughs> it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. So, yeah, we've got this garbage here down the bottom of the screen. It's very dim and the colours are wrong. I'm sure that's all supposed to be um, light blue with white text at the top. Uh, and it's almost like there's some banding or something going on. It's like, I don't know, there's something really weird with the colour signal. But anyway, you can see even go up and down. I'm not even sure if that red bar is supposed to be red there, the selection bar. I honestly can't remember. But if we're going to say, uh, let's do, where's the graphics one? Graphics tests. Test picture. You can see it is actually displaying, but the colours just look really weird and washed out. And I don't know, like this. Well, there is a colour problem, isn't there? It's bizarre. It's uh, a very strange DAC related, though, I think. And if we do uh, test scroll, you can see that's working. These are good things to do because that shows me, uh, you know, it's giving me confidence there that Lisa. And Alice, certain aspects of them seem to be normal. It's not like there's a, a fundamental problem there. There isn't. Uh, test raster. That looks okay. RGB test. And again, you can see we've got red, we've got green, we've got blue. So it's not like we've got a missing colour. This is why I'm more inclined to think it, it might be a VREF issue. Generally with DAC problems, you would get a problem with one specific colour channel there. You know, like it might be red, you might have a red tint or a green tint or a blue tint. or It might look weird, like yellow or purple or something because of one of those colours either being too high or too low. Um, that isn't what we're seeing. It just kind of looks like an analogy sort of problem. And if you cast your mind back to when I looked at that A2000, I'll stick a link up there to that. It was a similar sort of weirdness and that was a uh, low voltage going to the DAC 
So yeah, I think voltages. So looking at the page of the schematic with the uh, DAC on it, one of the things that immediately caught my eye was this circuit down here. Um, I think this is some sort of voltage reference circuit by the looks of things. You can see this is a weird component here. What, what's this here? An LM385-1.2. And it's got what looks to be a Zener or something in there. Is that? I think it is. It's got the wavy line. So is this some sort of voltage reference? It may well be. So this this is where I think I'm going to start. We've got 5 volts here coming through a coil and a resistor. We've got a load of caps here, caps there, a resistor, uh, another resistor. So a number of things to check. But the first thing we're going to do is just uh, measure this here. So well, I don't know if you can see that. I'm a bit close. It looks like the diode is in a chip. It's 8 pins and it's between pin 4 and pin 8. So whilst it's on, I'm just going to measure between ground, I've got my probe down there stuck into the ground contact, and uh, pin 8, so you can't see what I'm doing, I'll probably show you this later if it's of interest. I'm seeing 2.4 volts there, and it's bobbing around a little bit. Switch the power off, and you can just about see the meter there. I'm going to measure from the positive side on pin, uh, where's it gone, pin 4 down here and the negative side of the meter on pin 8 well we've almost got a short there that I'm sure is not right I think we might have landed on the fault straight away so if I just bring in this other board here and you might be able to see this a little bit clearer same thing between you know positive on pin 4 negative on pin 8 we don't have a short 604.604 that is kind of what I would expect for a Zener uh, now bear in mind, you get a reading the other way probably as well. 734, and that's kind of holding. So uh, I'm just going to just double check that again. So positive probe on pin 4, negative on pin 8. Yeah, we've got a very, very low resistance. So I think what I'm going to do is, the other board, I haven't shown you that, that'll be another video. That one is not getting uh, anywhere further. It will not boot at all. So I'm going to swap the chip from the other board onto this board, just uh, to see if that solves that issue. What I might do actually is remove that chip first of all, and then measure between those pads to make sure we don't have the same reading there. Because it could be a cap or something like that that's shorted. So I've got some flux around that chip, I've just uh, put a piece of captain tape around the jumper over there, and uh, I'm just doing the same here. So I'll just uh, make sure those are taped up, and they are. And yeah, this is not going to be easy because he's right next to the blooming jumpers. But it's a small IC, so it should come off pretty easily. I want to try and pull it away from the uh, jumpers, which is why I'm trying to get the screwdriver down that side of it. Someone has been tinkering here, I'll show you why, because on the underside of the jumper, someone's actually soldered the wires. You know the points where the jumper are so it's not like it's conflicting with the jumper position at the moment but someone has sold it which is really strange did they think the jumper wasn't working maybe and they thought it was trying to do sync on green or that's why it looks a bit weird i don't know but uh, anyway i do think this is a clue might not be the faulty component let's just get that off there we go yeah it might not be the faulty component but it is a huge clue uh, the amazing thing is, we're only two minutes into this and we've picked up on, uh, hopefully, a clue straight away. So I've got a cotton bulb with some IPA, I'm cleaning up now, because obviously we want to measure on there and a set with the meter and if the uh, flux is all over it, that's just going to make things a little bit awkward. Now if we're really unlucky, we're still going to have a low resistance slash short here, which means it's probably going to be the dark. I mean, it could be one of those caps still, I'm not ruling that out yet. Yeah, our short's gone. So, uh, where's the little component? I've lost the bloody thing now, it's here. So let me just try and uh, work out which one's pin one. Hang on. So I'm going to have to wipe the surface of that because I cannot see the pin one marking at all. Yeah, now that's off the board, I actually think that's reading normally. So I don't think it is that. I think it may well be the the DAC or something else in the circuit here 
I mean, we've still got a reasonable size resistance there, so maybe that's what it is. Get about 320 ohms, roughly. Yeah, and here's that jumper on the underside. It's really weird. Why has someone joined that across there? There's nothing wrong with the actual jumper. So, I mean, it's not conflicting with the way it's set. The jumpers are across the other side there are going, you know, to the right-hand side of the board, which on the underside, flip it over, obviously, it's the left. But I'm going to just detach that anyway, because that shouldn't be there. I don't know what someone was thinking about joining that up. It, why would you do that? It's really weird, to say the least. You test the jumper. If the jumper joins, why would you want to solder a wire there? Because then if someone solders, sticks a jumper in that position there, it's going to mess with it up totally, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. So, it's just like a solder bridge. That is uh, odd, though. So I think I need to uh, borrow the one off the other board. I've ordered some of these, but there'll be a week or two. So, it might not be this, but it's good to have some spares. But we'll just do uh, exactly the same thing, we'll just get some captain tape, I shove it like that, right down, so that I know I'm on the actual bottom, almost on the PCB, and then wrap it around like that, so that's taped up. Just testing it without that, actually, you just get a black screen, which is no wonder, because you've got no voltage reference at all. Uh, let's just put that around like that. I'll test it briefly, I wouldn't want it to leave it powered up a lot long without that reference but it should be okay so if we now remove this one let's just get a little bit of uh, flux on there as well actually but bear in mind when we uh, took it off and measured it off the board I don't know if I showed you I was getting a measurement in each direction which is not what I would expect actually I guess now we've got that one off, we can compare and uh, measure this one. Right, that video issue has uh, not uh, improved, so it's not that little voltage reference. Something I just noticed from testing, when it starts to work, I thought let's just feel around. The one chip hadn't felt the test temperature of this, it's getting red hot, but it was working. It was, this is the thing with the bottom of the screen, and I thought it's got to be something to do with the addressing. I wonder if it's something to do with Bridget, and that was when I felt it red hot, switched it off, powered it back on, it's just the same, it's working okay. But just inspecting here, I'll, sh I'll put you on macro. So you're on a macro there, can you see this pin is out here? I've just literally pushed it, it moves, it's not even soldered on. And you see this end pin here? It's pretty much bridged to the uh, pin next to it. So I'm just going to take this back over to the mat, deal with those two issues, uh, and then uh, retest it, I think. Right, that, you may think that solved the video problem, it hasn't, trust me. It's intermittent, it's like one minute you can power it on, but we haven't got the graphic problem at the bottom, and when that problem's not there, the colours look normal, so I could be barking up the wrong tree with the DAC. We could have some sort of clash on Lisa or something, like on the data bus. Something really weird could be going on where it's going to cause them to short, you know, certain signals to short, short at some point. Anyway, you can see the chip RAM is okay there. I'm testing that with my 2 meg chip uh, memory. The colours still aren't right. There's a little bit. I don't you can see like an overshoot of green on there. So there's definitely something going on. Maybe it is the DAC. Anyway, so chip RAM is okay. If I feel the top of Bridget now, it's not red hot. It's warm, but it's not hot like it was before. It could be that that chip is now intermittent. That might be why we had the, the stuff at the bottom third of the screen here, because my reasoning behind that was, uh, and I could be wrong, something, mind you, how would it actually be running code? Because, well, I don't know, we're running the diagnostics ROM here. It's probably primarily running from uh, ROM, actually. So, yeah, it could be, could be that. Could be Bridget. Uh, anyway, everything else in here tests. Let's just do the colour stuff again. Hang on, where's it gone? Uh, oh, let me show you something next. Let's go back to the main menu. If I do drive tests, I've got the IDE drive connected because I thought let's just rule out the 245s and the gals there. Although it could be another signal from one of the gals. You can see there straight away that detects correctly. So this is a different drive than I showed in the last video. It comes up saying 0323 SMI model. Rev 2010, which was when it was manufactured, I think. But you can see the surfaces are seven sectors, cylinders, block size, and that's consistent. What I can do is just power that off and stick my other compact flash card in, and we should see the same settings we saw previously. Now it may take a couple of power cycles, so you can see there that's dark, it's dim, it's not as bright as it should be. 
and it's uh, weird around the edges but look it's getting a little bit further so we've made a little bit of progress there but there is still some temperature sensitive problems on this board and if we're going to drive tests again Gary IDE test yeah there you go you'll remember that if you saw the previous video dot 35 CF card version 2 and the geometry there is the same I can remember uh, and it matches that other card probably it's uh, almost identical I think on, on try one so we know the chip memory is okay the audio I'll show you that I've tested that as well if I do yeah so I've got the two channels plugged in there I've tested the filter I'll show you that I think so that's working I have to do play test module that works it's in stereo so yeah despite perhaps needing a recap the caps aren't too bad actually but it will need doing that's fine as well uh, main menu go to the graphics stuff again yeah you can see the, the colors aren't we right there's some weird stuff going on that does not look correct it's a bit blurry and a bit I don't know what the word is it's like the contrast is not quite right on it test screen oh that one doesn't work that always crashes it that's just a problem in diagram as far as I understand doesn't work on any of my machines that uh, I'm tempted to remove the real-time clock chip actually because I've seen the real-time clock chip cause weird things with graphics in diagram there you know it's like it's got three data bus connections hasn't it I think three connects on three data bits so if something goes wrong with the RTC that can cause you a problem with uh, boots in there so might just do that I'm gonna remove the battery and we haven't done that yet we really should have done that first of all yeah there's no other tests I can do on this at the moment I could try and add a fast RAM sim but I did that before it's not detecting anything but that doesn't surprise me because there's a little bit of corrosion around there one or two vines need plugging I think fast RAM is not going to work until I deal with that F245 I might do that next though I might remove the battery and deal with that 245 just to see if we can get the fast RAM up and then we're kind of left with this working out what this weird intermittent colour thing is and you know uh, the the problem with the graphics uh, at the bottom of the screen sometimes so looking at page six of the schematics here the pins on Bridget that were affected ED15 I can't see where that is on here I used PCB Explorer just to confirm that it is one of the data uh, bus connections uh, it's interesting how they mark differently on here you've got the D here and then you've got DRD so I'm not sure which one it corresponds to but it's one of the data bits on one side or the other there that would have been affected uh, and the other one is the CDAR which uh, hang on this uh, yeah it could be that one there CDAR which goes to the BR uh, underscore W I must be reading right something maybe uh, Buster maybe that's related to the Buster side I don't know so if that was set incorrectly that could have caused some damage to the Buster side of this chip um, now it's still I mentioned it was warm after a minute or two it's pretty hot actually so I suspect there could still be a fault on this chip and it may well have been caused by that pin floating or shorting well not, I forget which one was shorting one, but it was almost short wasn't it one of them was almost shorting one of them was disconnected this I think is perhaps the one that was floating it was lifted up which would mean you, you've not got a, a, you know a determined high or low it could be uh, either you know it can flip one minute it can be high then it can be low it can just be floating in the middle and of course because that controls direction your data going that way or the other way you know from uh, buster through to the chip ram or where it go wherever it goes to i'm not sure where the bridge works there the direction problem with that can kill transceivers either the transceivers in here or it could kill something somewhere else on the board so i suspect there's still an issue with this chip so back over to what I think is a DAC issue and I'm not sure I made it crystal clear before but when we measured, I measured 2.4 volts here this is a 1.2 volt voltage reference, I know that because I looked at the date sheet an LM385-1.2, uh, the clue is that 1.2 it's 1.2 volts so the very fact we got 2.4 volts over there we definitely got an issue around here uh, anyway we ruled out that chip the next thing uh, I thought of doing is just measuring these resistors which I've just done, they measure okay um, although one of them I think I forget which one gave me a bit of a weird reading and the only thing I could see in parallel with it was this cap I think it was this one when I was measuring this one here which because I'm not measuring 1k there I thought 
it's got to be this so I'm going to take that off and check that capacitor C500 it's probably going to be on the underside so I'm not sure if I showed you but I took off the capacitor and if I measure its uh, resistance you can see it's turned into a 660 ohm resistor that is the problem that is why I bent my probe there look that is why we saw two and a half volts on the VREF there instead of 1.2 volts which is what I was expecting because it is 1.2 volt voltage reference so I removed it from here you can see the pads still got a bit of solder on so we'll just clean those uh, pads up it's just a hundred nanofarad cap that so I might not have something at the exact same physical dimensions this is 1206 or something or 1208 I'm not sure uh, yeah I think the best I've got are some of these ones actually so these might be slightly too, no they're about the right size these actually these should do the job just get to uh, end off there and lob that on there, yeah that's just the right size so we'll just uh, wheel that into uh, approximate position here and add a tiny bit of solder down here that'll do Strain it out somewhat and a tiny little bit of solder on that side. Looks like we removed some of the solder from there as well, so I just had a tiny little bit of uh, that side's alright. And then we should get a little bit of flux on there. And I'll just uh, reflow it with the Antex just because you get a nice shape to it. As you can see, that looks almost factory. It's perhaps a bit too much on that one now. Yeah, that's not too bad. And if we clean that up, and then we'll go retest it, I'm hoping we should see now 2.4 volts on the VREF there for the DAC it's an interesting fault uh, and uh, the other thing I did is remove that bit of uh, solder that was joining that uh, jumper there quite why someone bridged the connections on the jumper when the jumper was good I don't know maybe they thought the problem was something to do with the sink on green but no when you get problems like that where it looks uh, washed out you know the colours just look weird and it just doesn't look right there's some ghosting and stuff going on generally you're going to be looking at the DAC it's going to be something DAC related it might not always be but from experience I've seen DAC problems before that one on that A2000 board I looked at was very similar in terms of behaviour there and it was the same sort of thing I think I think it was a voltage reference missing on that in fact on that one it was two buffer chips there that were not getting 5 volts were they the voltage level was low there, so it have been 5 volts on that one, it was like 2 or something. I'm just putting a couple of layers of captain tape as near as possible. And I need to get that battery off, don't I? I really should have done that right at the start, but it's not really getting any worse, is it? That's the thing, it's not like leaking as we're doing this. It's uh, but for temperature and stuff, you know. You, you really should get it off, when I say temperature, I mean like you're soldering around here with hot air and stuff. Uh, you really don't want that battery on there, so we'll do that in a sec. We'll get this chip off, because the pads are awful, uh, the pins are awful, I just like to clean it all up properly. Can't do that when the chip's there, and we'll swap the chip out as well, we'll put a new F245 on. So uh, anyway, let's just have a little bit of flux, while well, that's uh, heating up the hot air there, hang on. A little bit of flux on each side. Hopefully we won't lose any of the pads here, but you know what, it's totally possible we will. Because this is pretty corroded, certainly on one side. I'm not sure how much of that you caught, because the battery, when the camcorder, literally gave me about three seconds notification, and then went off. So I might have just missed the end of removal of that, but anyway, you can see it's, uh, it's off there now, let's just stick on the mark. 
and we'll just gently clean here I'm trying to avoid the print on that label I think if we can sort the RAM out hopefully this might fix the fast RAM there's still potential this problem with the Bridget because it was to say getting hot that was a clue there was a problem there um, we need to get a uh, 174 on here I don't know what pads are missing and stuff around there and some corrosion around those resistors but uh, other than that and a recap there's very little to do to this board I think this one is going to be the easiest by far I might be blocking the shot here because the way I've got to position myself see these pads up here are pretty bad you know you have to go up and down them a couple of times That one looks awful. Let's try and do these ones here. Are they even there? One of them is. I'm going to try and go right up to these vias as well. These are usually solder filled the vias up here. So it's seldom a problem where the uh, you know fail completely in this area you see there's a trace there that's missing I think on that first pad as you can see up here it look awful those are probably where, where the issue was it probably wasn't making a connection and uh, obviously one there so I've zoomed you in a little bit closer there so you can see this pad here is super dirty these two are super dirty and the trace and vias and things here are, are not visible because it's so dirty so I've cleaned up a bit here, we need to tin all these vias and stuff here and make sure they're through to the other side we've got uh, one which you can't see somewhere around here I think, it might be that second one up the top there where there's nothing on the actual vias so that's probably what the issue was the chip was probably alright but anyway I'll put a new chip on it anyway this crystal here is squashed right up here, you can't really see from this distance but the can short to this pin and the can is also short to that pin so there's no way that would be working and it's kind of stuck down can you see that I think it's just the corrosion and stuff that's made it stick down I can't even move it it's well and truly stuck down there uh, anyway so that needs uh, something to do to it the next thing we'll do is just remove this battery I should have done it earlier but we'll do that anyway and then I can start to clean up all around this area I'm going to pull that cap off at the moment it serves no purpose other than to be something to leak around that area um, but we'll replace it I've asked the owner of these boards if he's happy for me to get some cap kits so I was going to go for the ones from Amiga kit they're only about £7 each for 4000 so I'm going to need a couple for these 4000s and four others although I've not inspected the others maybe the place that sent these to me have recapped some of them already but anyway I need a cap kit for this and the other one I think so we'll just add uh, some uh, solder and this is not going to be easy I don't think because obviously the connections are corroded You know, the tip might not be optimal for what I'm trying to achieve here with this. It's not going to transfer as much heat as a big chunky wedge tip or something like that. Anyway, let's uh, see. Let's just see how we get on. You can smell the uh, battery electrolyte there. Often the best way to do these actually is to heat one side and then try and pull the battery through once it's reached temperature. Ugh, that battery's horrible. Things are all sticking to it, it's all gooey. If, like mine, your uh, nozzle there gets all dirtied up with flux, just soak it in some IPA. I put it in a cap of IPA for 10 minutes, came back and then uh, pushed my metal uh, prodding tool through it and cleaned it out and uh, now it's working really well again. Yeah, it's hanging off that now, so just uh, reheat these, I think. That one there's still got some solder on it. Yeah, that side's out. Let's do that one. And that side's out, there we go, horrible crusty battery off the board yeah and there's a quick look around there so that chip, did it fall off? it kind of looks like it doesn't it? it looks like all the connections on that side fell off and then someone heated this side but can you see we've got a bridge there 
that may have been causing us some problems while I've been testing them, never noticed that. So uh, we'll clean that up as well while we're here. Uh, and you can get a better look at that now as well. So yeah, lots of clean up work. You can see that the wire down here is not good. I'll probably fill that and put a piece of kind through the other side to here and the second one as well. All the others just need tinning up and testing through to the other side. This pad here is awful. It was uh, It's barely hanging on. You can see it. I think it's actually lifted by the looks of things. So I am kind of working on multiple things at once here. I'm just using vinegar here to have a little bit of a scrub around this stuff. It's looking better already looks from having a bit of a scrub with vinegar. These pads here are awful. I hope they survive. So with a bit of vinegar on there we'll have a little bit of a scrub with the fiberglass pen. So let's see if these can come up a little bit better. Bear in mind we can you know get flux on these in a certain reflow. Just gently clean the tops. I tend to reflow these vines here, I tend to get them back to a copper surface and then I tend to reflow them and just check connectivity. More often than not, you'll find it is just a bit of surface corrosion. And I think that's the case with this. This is not as bad as some of the others I've seen. But reflowing these as they were is near impossible. You've got to kind of get all this stuff cleaned up here with the fiberglass pen before you'll find solder will adhere to anything. Yeah, there we go. It's starting to look a little bit better. I'm not worried about getting copper here. Copper is what I want, actually. There we go. Right, uh, these ones here, I'm just going to be gentle with. Oh, they're really bad. Let's have another go with some vinegar. There you go, look how much better that is now. Right, let's get some flux on there and uh, have a little bit of a clean up. We'll start with these pads here I think. Good measure will reflow on the side of that. And we'll have a go at reflowing these as well. That has just not melted, there we go. And uh, what I tend to do here actually uh, is the same old thing. Is use the braid, try and absorb the solder and uh, replace it completely. Where they're blackened like that, if you rub on the top of the edge, you will find it just cleans it up. You can see that looks like new. Let's do that one as well. Yeah, so this is one of those multi-pass things, you know, where you've got to do a number of steps. You know, you may think that's sufficient and then reflow them and it's not. You've got to clean up and then you'll get all the crusty alpine and uh, flux and contamination stuff off there, as you can see. Look how much cleaner that's looking already. Uh, and then have another pass with some fresh flux and some fresh solder. Vinegar sometimes helps as well.
yeah you can see that it's starting to look a bit better there still really bad the first two pads on this uh, chip here we're going to need wires because the traces are just so 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 bad one of them's detached and the other one the wire is terrible so that I think is the issue that's why the fast ram wasn't working so uh, the next thing I'm going to do and I can't even see where the solder points are because the green is uh, just try and uh, remove this cap actually I'm going to use two irons here uh, I want to be careful because I don't want to melt the socket and just move the air extractor out of the way just get in down there yeah solder points aren't melting mm, some sort of flow in there let's just try around here sorry I nudged the camera there This holder is not sticking there. Oh god. This is proving painful. Right, let's try and remove it again. So on down that way. It's this left hand side here that's not freeing up. Despite the crazy amount of solder around that area. There we go. So I've got a new F245 on there, it's uh, anchored in the right hand corner here and the top left corner there. I'm just going to bob into these to secure a few and then we'll drag over it. God the solder's not joining very well there, almost. Anyway, you get the general idea. Just need to do the same thing on the other side. I'm not sure why it's not flowing very well. It could just be the state of the pads. Woohoo! There we go, fast round back. So I've only got one 4 meg sim in at the moment, and uh, I've not got the mouse connected, so let me just connect to the mouse. But you can see down there, 4096 that has detected it correctly. Test fast mem. Oh yes. So I think this board is pretty much there actually. All of the weird behaviour seems to have gone away as we've cleaned up around there and stuff. It's booting every single time consistently. The video is looking uh, tip top now as well. So yeah, I'm very pleased with this. We're nearing the end of this repair. So you can see the 245 there, it's looking really shiny actually, everything around here is looking really nice and shiny. Let's get three more sims in and see if it will detect the full 16 meg. The sim sockets on this are really good, this is the best one of these I have seen, it's almost like new, uh, except, except for the clips here that always are a problem. You know, it's like, you find they just don't blooming grip. To be fair, there you go, you've got to press them in a fair a fair bit when they're new like this. These ones are, are like new, these sim sockets actually. You can do a clip there and there. Final one. I've got no reason to believe this won't work actually, because they are in such good condition. Let's see what that comes up with now. 
yeah, full address range there, 740000 to 7FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
start to see though that is looking an awful lot better yeah so large blobs of solder my soldering's always like that generally but they're nice and clean and equal sizes so I've just cleaned up around here too those aren't too bad on that side uh, there is a sticky label here look it needs to come off so yeah I'll just try and get that off with a bit of IPA so I've got the HCT174 back on there and the fixed wire and we've reflowed a lot of things around there let's now have a brush and then we'll go test it I may take off that resistor array yet but I certainly will take off the real time clock chip just to get access to around there to clean that up because if you just leave it untreated it's uh, you know you're gonna it's gonna haunt you you're gonna get problems with something around there if you don't remove all this stuff the capacitor there looks uh, really clean trim cap the other caps on this board don't look uh, problematic actually they look okay you know they don't look like they've leaked or anything but they do look original I don't think they've been swapped anyway you can see how much cleaner that has uh, come out I think there's a wire there and I think the solder points coming up underneath and it's touching and joined maybe from the hot air from here so yeah I'm just gonna heat it with some hot air I'll just see if it'll come loose it's well and truly welded onto the board there it is yeah so just measuring the ground here we've got ground down here yeah that is not ground so <laughs> that is another problem that might explain some of the weird things that have been going on anyway we've reflowed that uh, I think what I'll do is just bend this crystal away from that actually right so we're all booted up let's go into uh, the tests I'm not sure the real-time clock tests work on here actually yeah they just sort of sit there like that we really need to get kickstart in there well now we've got the ram and everything we can test it out properly can't we so i'll swap back over to kickstart let's boot this up from hard disk and stuff and uh, run sys check so you can see it's booting from id there whoa we've got a desktop up and we've got 16 meg that memory up there is about right when uh, i've got uh, 16 meg it shows about 13.587 free so uh hmm, that's working isn't it Let's go into syscheck. I think I might have that on here. Might need to boot syscheck from floppy actually because I don't think it's got the RTC test in the version that's on here. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to tell, but I've swapped over to the other board. The board we were just looking at is pretty much there now. The only thing that remains is I've got a problem with the real time clock and the Zorro 2 is not working. Now, I didn't show you or film that part, but the point I tested the Zorro 2, it wasn't working. One of the things I did is I felt the Bridget down here and it's still getting red hot. So some fault has occurred to that. I'm not so sure it was the, the, the things we saw because one of the pins was floating, wasn't it? It could have been that one actually, because that was the direction pin, which I think that would have meant that it's toggling between you know one direction and the other because that pin was floating. Ultimately, that would cause some of the transceivers within it to fail. So I think it's uh, it's working in terms of the chipman on that other board. It's not working in terms of the bridge. That's where the name Bridget comes from. The bridge to the Zorro side of things, which is why Zorro is not working. So I've spoken to the owner of the board and uh, suggested, you know, uh, I need a Bridget and asked if I'm okay to buy one for it. So in the meantime, I've moved on to the other board. Now there are a few things with this board. Obviously it's still got battery. We'll remove that in a minute before we do any of the soldering to the board. But also, I don't you can see this, can you see these pins here? They're slightly bent. Uh, I'll perhaps give you a better look in a minute. Yeah, you can see better from that angle. They were touching, shorting, so I've just bent that, you know, moved it across. What that one there needs is a press down from the top to get it to go uh, sort of more in line with where it should be in the channel. And this one here just needs pushing back a little bit. Could replace that connector but we'll wait until we've got this board up and running and i'll test it with a zorro card and see if it's actually working if we find we can insert and remove it and these aren't shorting or becoming a problem then it'll probably be okay 
But in any case, this was the first board I actually looked at, and I'll show you, it's uh, really weird, this one. It uh, doesn't give you any diagnostic information at all. So, testing with the diagram. Now, that's a bit of a mistake, the point I just made there about it not giving any diagnostic information at all. That is diagnostic information. It's testing the chip RAM, it's got past that, and do you see that? The video is just gone. This is what this board does most of the time, you just don't get any video. Now, in terms of diagnostics, if I was to connect up a serial cable, you know, uh, to a PC or something, diagram, when you hold, I think it's the left mouse button down, it will uh, communicate via serial. So if you open a terminal program on the, uh, you know, the other computer that's connected to the serial port, you will see what it's actually doing. So that's one thing, one thought I did have, we could do that. But there's something else I just discovered a minute ago, uh, re-looking at this board now. I mean, I haven't spent very long on it, a few minutes at most, but just seeing what we're seeing there, I, 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 and I didn't cover this with the first board, but one, one of the things I do, the tap test, I'll show you. So, you know, while it's on and it's crashing or something or it's booting and you're getting weird things going on, just have a bit of a tap around the board in various locations uh, to see if anything changes. The other thing is to just gently press, you know, so lift the card there. Any difference? No, just the same. Push down a little bit, any difference? No, just the same. Not a lot, you don't want to damage things and bend things and bend connectors and stuff, but just enough. If there's a bad connection somewhere, it might reveal something. And the thing that, uh, and I did the exact same thing on the other board, as I say, uh, press down on various locations. And I'll show you what I found. This area here is making no difference at all. The video is gone again. But when I press lightly here on Agnes, so I'm pressing down on Agnes now, you will see, hopefully, look at that, it works. And this detected the full 16 meg. So uh, yeah, <laughs> this is the thing. So you can understand that if I let go, just let it get stable. Look, watch if I let go, straight away. Oh, you saw it go weird. Look, and it's gone. Yeah. And I'll demonstrate that again, so you can see roughly how much pressure. And this is also why I don't like to. You know, some people say, "Well, why do you test on a cardboard box? Why don't you test on solid, hard?" surface well you can't get any kind of flexibility i find that when you test on a box like this you can see you can see that if you look how much the board is flexing it's not a lot we've got some flexion here and we're going to flexion all around here so this is the whole purpose of doing it this way it's, it might not be well it probably isn't as uh, esd safe as doing it on a mat but you won't get any flexion like that on a, a mat you know you'd be lucky if you get uh, that amount there because the mat is very solid underneath it whereas we've got the ability there just to get that little bit of flexion and that is all it needs it's consistent you, you you hold there for like that it boots and everything's fine you let go the video goes crazy so it's something around here it could be lisa because let's say you know it's it's going to be something around this area here it could even be one of these uh, gals here actually it could even be paula I don't know, but the caps don't look like they've leaked very much, if at all, actually, around there. So it's a bit of an odd one. It's a bit of an odd one. I think it's going to be a dry joint around Alice, if I'm honest. So I've had to bring this video to an abrupt end again. There's going to be a number of other parts to this series. Hopefully we'll wrap up the A4000 in the next uh, part. It might even split into a third part, actually. But there's been a little bit of variety here. We've seen some more RAM faults that we've covered sort of previously on other A4000 repairs I've done. I'll post some links to those uh, down below. I've cut lots of things out. I've not shown every single step along the way here, but as we get towards the end of this series, you can see how clean and tidy the boards are at the end. And it's the same with some of the removal stuff, you know, the camcorder cut short there, but we've got lots of examples on previous videos of removing the, the same sorts of chips off these boards. So I do hope you found the video interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. Just one dollar a month makes a huge, huge difference to the continuation of this channel. Thank you very much for watching and subscribing. I'll catch you in the next video.